Revelation, the third chapter. Revelation, the third chapter. Verses 14 through 22. We have been looking at the, in our journey in the last several weeks, several studies, we've been looking at the seven churches of Asia Minor, seven churches of the book of the Revelation, and of the seven churches dealing with the major dispensations down through the years. And uh, each of the seven churches speak of a dis different dispensation, but at the same time, we find illustrative mention of each of the seven churches in current society today. But I don't think there's any one of the seven churches that's any more representative of the churches in America today and the church universal today than this church we'll be looking at in our study at this time. It is the seventh of the seven churches. It is the church at Laodicea. We've looked at the pitiful church, which was the church at Ephesus, the persecuted church, the church at Smyrna, the popular church, which was the church at Pergamos, the paganized church, the church at Thyatira, the powerless church, the church at Sardis. We saw the preaching church, the church at Philadelphia. We're going to be looking at the putrid church, the church of Laodicea. Of the seven churches that Jesus addresses in the Revelation text, he commends two out of the seven. Five he has condemnation for. And there's no greater condemnation for any of the seven churches from the mouth and the pen of John and the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ than the church of Laodicea. Stand, if you will, please, out of honor and recognition of the reading of the Word of God. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. As I read audibly, follow with me in your scriptures silently. And under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right. Now let me pause for a moment. Notice there in that 14th verse, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. What is significant about that? All of the other six churches, all of the other six says in, and it would name the city. This is of the Laodiceans. An emphasis needs to be understood, and we'll talk about that. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire, that thou mayest have, be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that thy shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Thank you, and we may be seated. I believe history reveals, without any reservation, I believe I could say it pretty dogmatically without any possibility of challenge or chiding or in any way critical by the outside of saying that it's not true, but I believe history will reveal without any question a nation, a people, that's in the position of having plenty. A nation or a people that seem to have all of the possessions and the plenty and the prosperity that can be afforded any people or any country seem to have a feeling that, as I've used the little cliche for years, I've got the world on a string and string it's uh, by my finger, and uh, there's nothing that can hinder me or halt anything that I want to do or say. 
May I remind us that I believe that a people, a nation, a family, a church that's in the position they feel they've got it all licked, I believe it's the time that you find that they are simply have forgotten God. Simply have forgotten God. And may I say at this juncture, one of the greatest failures I believe that we have in America today is that we have forgotten God. We've forgotten God. I'm always appalled and amazed at the same time to find denominations that will look at current societal uh, declensions and try to determine if they need to be embraced or approved of by the church. They'll have council meetings and committee meetings, and they'll have debates and arguments and investigations, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, trying to determine how they ought to do and what they ought to say. And yet, at the same time, the Word of God has the answer, and they are not looking at, not searching for, not analyzing the Word of God to see what ought to be embraced and what ought not to be embraced out of society into the churches. And that is, I believe, because we're in a declension today, spiritually speaking, that there is a forgetfulness of who God is and what God's Word says in relationship to what we ought to do in our lives and in our churches. The seventh church that Jesus addresses is the church that has grown indifferent. It is a church that has grown callous. It is a church that has grown to compromise. It is the church that has grown uh, cold. It is the church that has become, as I call it, Christless in their ministry and what they are doing. May I remind us they had plenty of wealth. They had plenty of accolades. They had plenty of approval of the society around them, very rich society around them, by the way. Uh, the church at Laodicea had received a, the most severe rebuke of all the seven churches of any of the others because Jesus said, you're lukewarm. You're lukewarm. I'd rather you be hot or cold, but because you're not hot nor cold, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. You're lukewarm, Jesus said. In other words, Jesus says what you're doing theologically, doctrinally, biblically, and spiritually is sickening to me. And if we can use the young blood vernacular, I'm just going to vomit you out of my mouth. That is what Jesus Christ is saying about the church of the Laodiceans. The church at Laodicea, perhaps the most descriptive of the churches today in America. A lot of these churches today have uh, a lot of movement and a lot of motion, a lot of action, a lot of uh, show and high profile. But Jesus says, you are sickening because you've not stuck to the written, revealed, inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. I want us to notice four things as we think on the subject of the putrid church. Four things, very briefly, we're going to look at today. The destination of the communication revealed in verse 14. The description of the communicator recorded in verse 14. The diagnosis of the church reviewed in verses 15 through 17. And the directive to the church registered in verses 18 through 22. Notice in that 14th verse, the destination of the communication revealed. Notice it is to the pastor, and unto the angelos, the messenger, the pastor of the church. We've said this each time, and let me remind you that Jesus Christ is addressing the pastor of the local New Testament church. Did you realize that it's the pastor that according to the word of God in 1 Peter chapter 5 is the under shepherd? He's the one that's the responsible for the carrying out of the uh, comfort, the care and the communication and the preaching and the teaching of the word to the people in the church. The fifth chapter of 1 Peter verse 1 and following. The elders which are among you I exhort who also am an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and did the and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof not by constraint, but willingly not for a filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. The scripture says feed. That word feed is the little Greek word poimanitate. It means to shepherd, it means to lead, it means to guide, it means to provide, it means to direct, it means to correct, it means to challenge, it means to teach and to share the doctrine and present the truth of the Word of God. It is a fascinating word when you do the word study in relationship to the pastor's responsibility. And this is the reason the Lord Jesus Christ addresses each of these seven letters to the pastor of the local New Testament church. He says, lead the church, feed the church, feed the flock. 
And may I remind us a little footnote on that thought. Doesn't mean that the pastor is perfect by any stretch of the imagination. That's not what Jesus is saying. But it's the pastor that shows the lo- shoulders the load. It's the pastor that has the responsibility. It's the pastor that God charges with the responsibility of preaching and teaching the truth of the Word of God. It always amazes me how people will allow Satan to lead them into believing a devil's lie. And as a result of that, so many times I've found, found down through the years, a person will believe that somehow, some way, the pastor stepping on the toes. By the way, this happens more often than you would ever think. But as a result of the pastor's responsibility in preaching and teaching the truth of the Word of God, I found down through the years that someone will get a little miffed at the pastor because of something that he said. Well, it's my responsibility simply to preach and teach the Word of God. It's my responsibility and any pastor's responsibility simply to say, Thus saith the Word of God. But as a result of that, somebody will get their feelings hurt saying, Well, you know, that bothered me. And they will not admit that it's because of that little secret sin, that little compartmentalization of what they want to do rather than what the God, Word of God teaches them and uh, speaks to them about doing, as a result of that, they get angry. I've said to folks down through the years, if I preach and say something that you're angry about, tell God, don't tell me. It's not my responsibility to try to appease. It's my responsibility simply to preach the truth of the Word of God. And that's what Jesus is saying when he addresses each of these seven letters to the seven churches. He's saying it's the pastor that has the responsibility. May I remind us that Jesus did not send it to the pulpit committee. He didn't send it to uh, the deacons or the Sunday school teachers. He didn't send it to the uh, any of the other heads or official uh, offices of the local New Testament church. He sent the letter to the pastor. It's the pastor that God holds responsible for preaching and teaching and leading. But when the sheep jump the fence, as I've called it down through the years, many times there will be the sheep jump, jumping the fence. If the sheep jumps the fence, he's not in the sheep fold so that the pastor can take the uh, have the responsibility and take the lead in preaching and teaching the truth of the Word of God. How are you supposed to do that? I've seen those uh, in history past where they will say, uh, this is why I left, this is what I've done, this has been my problem, etc., 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 and yet not staying under the Word of God. God holds the pastor responsibility for simply saying what the Scripture says, nothing more and nothing less. It is the sheep's responsibility to follow the shepherd, and the shepherd is Jesus Christ, and his under-shepherd is none other than the pastor of the local New Testament church. Notice not only the pastor, but notice the place of the church, of the church, of the Laodiceans. That is, he's saying, write to the, uh, those in the Laodicean church of the church, of the Laodiceans, the Laodiceans of the lukewarm. He says, this letter is to the church, which is to the pastor, which is of the church, of the Laodiceans. It is the church of the lukewarm, if you will. The church of the lukewarm is literally what the Lord Jesus Christ is addressing here. By the way, Laodicea was located about 40 miles southeast of Philadelphia about 90 miles east of Ephesus. It was the capital of uh, uh, Phrygia, uh, located on the road to Colossae, and Laodicea at the crossroads of the trade for the east and to Pergamos and to uh, Ephesus on the other side. It had a large manufacturing plant of wool and wool garments and wool products. Gold was plentiful. This would answer some of the questions as to why they'd become so self-sufficient in the sense of we have it all licked and we don't need anything. Gold was plentiful. Banking flourished in that era in that uh, particular city. It was known as the world's wealthiest city of that era of that day. The city was named by the Syrian king after his wife. He had a huge medical center there in Laodicea. It produced ISAF. This is the reason you'll find later where Jesus mentions and you need some ISAV for your eyes. They produced ISAV, which was exported around the world at that time. The church had become infected with the world's prosperity and the world's self-sufficiency and self-centeredness and self-reliance. Self-sufficient, self-centered, and self-reliant was where they were. Jesus said, you're lukewarm. Uh, We want to see Jesus' examination of the church. What does Jesus really see? What does he say? What is the prescription for the church and the problem they were having in Laodicea? Notice not only the destination of communication revealed, but notice the description of the communicator recorded. Let me remind us once again, each of the seven churches, Jesus would introduce himself with some of his attributes predicated and based upon what he's about to say in his correction of the church in that city at that time. 
Notice the description of the communicator revealed. First of all, he is portrayed as the final word. The final word. Jesus says, these things saith the amen. What does it mean? These things saith the amen. I've heard a lot of folks saying the preacher's preaching and everybody's going to die and go to hell and the whole crowd say amen. <laughs> the word amen simply means let it be so. Let it be so. Jesus says, I am the amen. Amen literally means let it be so or let it be so as is said. Jesus refers to this as the final word. He is the final word on anything and everything. He is the final say-so, and it refers to Jesus Christ as being the final word on what he's about to say to the church at Laodicea. He is God. He is sovereign. He is saying, I'm the first, the foremost, and the final. Whatever I say, it settles it, and there's nothing else to be done. Listen, when Jesus Christ makes a statement, when it is settled through the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no appeals court, there's no uh, Supreme Court, there's no uh, uh, lost, uh, hung jury. It is final, and it's said, and Jesus is saying, these things saith the amen, the final authority. He's the one that's sovereign. Amen, a word which simply means authority or final authority or the finality of a thing. God's word is the final authority on everything. If we want to know what we need to do, look at the word of God. If we want to know where the world is going, look at the word of God. If we want to have an answer on any issue in life, all we need to do is look at the word of God. The word of God is first, foremost, and final on every issue. Jesus Christ's description of himself he is portrayed as the final word. Secondly, he's portrayed as the faithful witness. Notice he says, the faithful and true witness. The faithful and true witness. Jesus Christ is the one that is always faithful. Jesus is the one that can be relied upon completely. Jesus is the one that is absolutely dependable. And the word there, truth, means absolutely genuine, real, not fake, not fabricated, but absolute and total in authority. Truth is something, and on the daily radio broadcast, I use this illustration. It comes from the 15th century theologian and church reformer, Jan Hus. Some of you might, in studying church history, recall that name. Jan Hus says, and let me quote this directly from him. Faithful Christians seek the truth, listen to the truth, learn the truth, love the truth, tell the truth, live the truth, defend the truth, even to death, end quote. And may I say, I cannot commend to us any greater statement than that was made. Learn the truth, live the truth, listen to the truth, defend the truth, even to the end, uh, if you will, even if we have to stand and face the firing squad, as I call it, because of standing for truth. Jesus Christ is the faithful witness. He is the true one. He is the only truth that we can go to. Everything else might waver. Everything else might have a definitive difference. But Jesus Christ is the faithful witness and the final authority he is truth. He is the apex of truth. He is the epitome of truth. He is total truth. And may I remind us, a witness is one who confirms something. Jesus is the one that confirms because he is genuine, he is faithful, he is true, and he keeps his word. We can never worry, never wonder if what Jesus says we can depend upon. He never fails us. Jesus is the one that is testifying against the church in this text. And he is saying, I am the true witness. I am the faithful one. I am the one that is the first and foremost and the final authority on everything that's to be said. He's setting the stage that what he's about to say to this church at Laodicea is final authority on their condition and position and what he is about to say to them. He is the final word. And he is the faithful and true witness. Also, we find he is portrayed as the foremost workman, the foremost workman, the beginning of the creation of God, the beginning, the archaea, goes back to the origin. Jesus Christ is saying, I am the original, I am the origin, I am the one that created it all. Jesus Christ here is uh, definitively stating that I am sovereign. I am in control. I'm the one that created you. I'm the one that created this world. I'm the creator, controller of all of the universe. He is saying, I am the creator. In fact, when you look at John chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 3, the scripture says, in the beginning, the archaea was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. 
All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And then when you study Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 through 18, you find that Jesus Christ is the creator controller. You find in that that he is identifying with Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Jesus Christ is saying, I am creator. I am the sole uh, sovereign source of all that's alive and in the world today. I don't know about you, but it gives encouragement and strength and hope and peace when we understand that Jesus is saying to the church at Laodicea, I'm sovereign. I'm the one that's the faithful witness. I'm the one that's truth. I'm the one that has the final authority. I'm the amen of the amen. And I'm the one that did the creation when everything was created. Jesus was not first created. He is the one that created it all. There are a number of religions today and Christian cults today that say that Jesus Christ was a good man, a good teacher, a good example. Jesus Christ was a created being. In fact, there's one uh, Christian cult, as it's called, that says that Jesus was created just like Lucifer was created, and he was Lucifer's brother. There's a good Greek word for that. Horse feathers. <laughs> he is portrayed as the foremost workman because he is the creator. He says, I am in control, is what he's saying to the church of the Laodiceans, the destination of the communication revealed, the description of the communicator recorded. But I want you to notice a major section of the text today, verse 15 through 17, the diagnosis of the church reviewed. Notice the prescription or his perception here in that 15th verse. I know thy works. He makes this statement to each of the seven churches. He's saying, I'm not a dummy, I'm not an idiot, I'm not uh, uh, so old that I cannot remember things. He's, not, he's saying here, I'm absolutely sovereign, I'm the one that's omniscient, I'm omnipresent, I know what you're doing, I know your mindset, I know your motive, I know the mandate in your life, I know what causes you to do what you're doing, I know thy works. He is saying, ladies and gentlemen, of the wealthy moving church in Laodicea, I am the one that knows everything that you're doing. There's no secret. There's nothing hidden. There's nothing that's sequestered away. I am in total, full knowledge of what you're doing and why you do it. There are a lot of folks today that somehow feel that you can hide something from God. There are a lot of people today that feel that because the wife doesn't know it, the husband doesn't know it, the son or daughter doesn't know it, the friend or relative doesn't know it, the preacher doesn't know it, that somehow, some way, that Jesus Christ does not know it. He is all-knowing and all-seeing. There's nothing hidden from God. And may I remind us, Jesus is reminding the church at the law of the Laodiceans that I am fully aware, I'm totally knowledgeable, I'm totally aware of what you're doing. I see through your lies, I see your heart, I know your petty excuses, I know your gripes and your belly aches, and I know why you complain and what you say and what you do. I know what motivates you to do what you're doing in the church of Laodicea. He is saying, I am fully aware he looks right into the recesses of our hearts. There's no little hidden compartmentalization. There's no segregating and separating from the totality of who we are. Jesus Christ knows every aspect and every part of your life and mine. And he's warning the church of the Laodiceans to understand, I know what you're doing and why you're doing it. He is saying if I can move forward, he's saying I know why you're lukewarm. I know why you're not hot on fire for me. I know why you're not cold. I know what motivates you. And literally the bottom line is, I want us to understand Jesus knew that as a result of the community they were in, because of the society they were living in, because of having all of the wealth and all of the things and all of the, the elements of society meeting every need that they had, Jesus Christ says, I know that this is what motivates you and moves you. You're looking at the material things and not the master of all things. The perception. But notice the problem in verse 15, the latter portion through verse 17. Jesus knows where they are. They're compromising. That thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Jesus says, he's just said, I'm all seeing. I have all perception. 
I know where you are. He's saying you're lukewarm. What does that mean? You're compromising. You are indifferent. You are sitting on the fence. You're apathetic toward anything that's called spirituality. I found that today permeates society among Christians, so-called Christians, than anything else. It is an indifference. It is a sense of compromise. It's a sense of apathy. It's a sense that says the church will always be there. I can go to church if I want to, or I can stay home if I want to. There's a mindset that says it doesn't make any difference whether other denominations or other Christians agree with me or not. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to embrace the world. I'm going to be a part of the world. I'm going to be a part of the go and the glitz and the glitter and the go, and no one's going to tell me what to do. I am indifferent toward spiritual things. Had an occasion a number of years ago after a Wednesday evening teaching service. We were meeting in here. And I was teaching the trilogy in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. The gift of uh, the gifts, the control of the gifts, and the misuse of the gifts. And after I finished and I stepped down and was standing here, three ladies that had, came, had, had come in that were visitors seated on the back came forward. They're asking questions. They were challenging my position that tongues talkers is not from God. They are not from biblical precepts and concepts. And each thing I'd say, they would uh, say, well, but what about and what about? And I'd go back to, this is what the Word says, this is what the Word says. After about 45 minutes, I decided I was just speaking to the wind. And uh, so I said, well, this is what the Word says regardless of what you think. And one of the ladies said, I don't care what the Bible says, I know what I believe. And ladies and gentlemen, that answers it today for the church of the Laodiceans. The church of the Laodiceans, the modern church today says, I don't care what the Word of God says, I know what I believe, I know what I want to do, and I'm going to do my thing whether the Word of God approves it or authorizes it or not. I simply am going to go my own way. It says the book of Judges, every man's doing that which is right in his own eyes. And that's where we are today. This is the reason I call it cotton candy theology, goosebump theology, kitchen theology, voodoo theology, is because everybody is doing their own thing, going their own way, regardless of what the Word of God says. And Jesus says to the church of the Laodiceans, you're compromising the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're compromising the written, revealed, inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God. And I want us to understand we cannot compromise the Word of God. We might disagree. We might say we're not going to obey it. We can do that if we will, but it's our detriment because God's Word says it. That settles it whether I want to follow it or not. apathetic, complacent, compromising. They had no zeal, no enthusiasm, no uh, uh, zealous hotness for Jesus Christ. He says there, you have no zeal, you're lukewarm, you're not hot. They were compromising with the world. They could hear the word preached and the message on sin and salvation and surrender, but they were not moved at all by the truth of the word of God. There was no conviction, there was no conversion, there was no commitment in their lives. For Jesus Christ. No surrender, no submission, no sacrifice. Jesus says, You make me sick. You make me sick. You make me want to vomit you up. Someone has said, and may I quote, saying lukewarm Christian is like saying dry water or cold heat or clean dirt. It makes no sense at all because it's an oxymoron. There are a lot of folks today will say, well, you know, I love Jesus, but I used to do this, but I've seen those on one occasion we had a young man in our church and he ultimately moved up to the Carolinas and later went on to be with the Lord. But he was concerned and uh, just about each week at prayer service, he'd say, pray for my daddy, pray for my daddy. His daddy had gotten saved supposedly when he was nine or 10 years old. The past 22 years, he'd been living with a woman that wasn't his wife. And most of those 22 years, he'd been living with multiple women, one at the time. And this young man said, I know he's saved. He said yes to Jesus, but look at his life. And I said, uh, Al, we need to start praying your daddy will get saved. It's an impossibility for a saved person to do what he's been doing for the past 22 years based on what you've told me. 
The number of folks today that because they're church members of a local Baptist, Methodist, uh, Presbyterian church, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, there's a sense that I'm all right, I'm saved, but they never said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. They've never submitted their lives under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. They've never said, Lord, take my life. Let it be only always used for thee. Compromise. Jesus says, you make me sick. They were lukewarm. Not only do we see the problem that is they're compromising, secondly, they're conceited, verse 17, because thou sayest, you know, if you say it, it's okay, because thou sayest, notice what they're saying. This is what Jesus has already said in his perception. I know your works. He says, now this is, this, he is reiterating to them what they're saying about themselves, whether they verbalize it word, word for word or not. He says, because thou sayest, I'm rich and increased with goods, and have need for no need for need of nothing. They had riches untold. God had blessed the church. They, had, they were prosperous. They had possessions. They had plenty. They had everything that the world could offer. If you'd put it in the 21st century vernacular, they had all of the technology. They had all of the uh, accoutrements in their church, all of the appointments in the facilities. And they had a huge campus and maybe multiple campuses. They had it all together as far as the world was concerned. They had it all licked. They had it all under control. Jesus says, you think you're rich. You think you've got it all together. You've increased in goods. It's called spiritual pride. They had not applied that in their lives at all. They were conceited, thinking, look at us, we've got it together. Churches today will brag about the multiple multi-million dollar budget. They will brag about their uh, brass baby beds and parking garages and mega buildings, etc., etc., etc. Perhaps you've heard me share from a personal illustration. Many years ago when we first started the work here, I'd go to the monthly... Uh, pastors meeting, pastors association, Baptist pastors association meeting. You know, that's the end thing to do. If you're a Baptist, you're going to meet with the Baptist pastors once a month, et cetera, et cetera. And I did. And after about three months, I, on the way back from one of the meetings, I said, Lord, if you'll forgive me, I won't ever do this again. Get into the pastor's meetings and uh, had about, out of, at that time, 214 in the association in this city, 214 churches. You'd always have between 6 and 14 people present out of 214 churches. That should have been a pretty good handwriting on the wall there. And the conversation was something like this. Well, I had 14 baptisms last Sunday. Well, our budget was a million and a half dollars last year. Is this kind of braggadocious stuff? Nothing about Christ, nothing about Jesus, nothing about soul winning, nothing about evangelism and outreach, nothing, nothing. It was always about the budget and the buildings and what we've accomplished and what we've done and what we've gotten. It was simply as the Laodicean church that says, I'm rich. We've accomplished it all. We've increased in goods. We have need for nothing. I made a little marginal note to be very careful about becoming conceited when the Lord provides abundantly. And that's what he's done in America today. He's provided America with wealth untold. He's provided the churches in America today wealth untold. We have more today in the ability today to preach the gospel, teach the gospel, and communicate the truth of Jesus Christ than any other time in history. But we become conceited and self-centered and the sense that we're rich and we have need for nothing but become lukewarm. We're not hot for Jesus, not zealous for Christ in our churches today. And may I simply shift it from churches generally to individuals specifically. That's where we are. The church is made up of individual believers. It's not a building, it's not a denomination, it's individual believers. And the only way this was possible for the church of the Laodiceans was for the individuals to be in that category. The church, the building, the facilities, the name was made up of people, individuals, individual supposed Christians that were claiming to know Christ as Savior and as Lord. This is the reason today you'll find in America very, 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 and at the risk of redundancy, may I say again, very few churches 
having revival meetings, revival emphasis. Back a number of years ago when I first went into full-time evangelism, we'd have eight services Sunday morning through Sunday morning. It started dwindling so the pastors would call. They would want Sunday morning through uh, uh, Wednesday or Wednesday through Saturday or Saturday night and Sunday morning and Sunday night. Then they simply started calling it weekend revival. One that first said that, I said, what in the world does that mean, weekend revival? He said, well, Sunday morning, Sunday night, of course. And I discovered down through the years in this ministry that we could have revival meetings and we'd call in evangelists and I'd be embarrassed during the course of the week could not get people to come. You'd say, could you come on Monday night? Well, I'll, be, I'll try to be there Monday night. Usually on Tuesday night's bridge night. I can't be there on Tuesday night. Wednesday night, I've got a meeting across town with so-and-so. On Thursday, I try to do my uh, uh, laundry. On Friday, I can't come because I do my grocery shopping. Preacher, I'll try to be there Saturday night if it doesn't rain. That's generally the mindset today. In the compromising Laodicean lukewarm uh, churches in America and around the globe. Nothing different from what we find that Jesus is addressing here in this text. In the olden days, as it used to be called, revival meetings where everybody in all of the community, they'd cease and desist and stop anything that was being done. And they would all gather together to hear the word of God proclaimed that their lives might be changed and revolutionized through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And that's simply not happening today because of being lukewarm, compromising with the world, conceded the mindset that I don't need revival. I don't need to go to the Sunday school. I don't need to study the Bible. I don't need to pray. I've got it all licked. I've got it all together. I don't need God other than when there's the funeral or when there's a health problem. Then I'm going to call on him. God, where are you when I need you? They're conceded. They remind us we need to be very, very careful of becoming conceited, compromising when God's provided so abundantly in all that's needed in our lives and the lives of our churches. We were saying that we have it all. We don't need anything. Verse 20, by the way, and we're going to go back through this, but I'm bringing it out at this point. Verse 20, Jesus wasn't even in the church. They were rich. They had riches, they had relationships with others, but not with Jesus. They had gold, but not God. They had possessions, but not position in Christ. They were dependent on materials rather than on the master himself. But when you look at that 20th verse, Jesus says, Behold, look intently and see, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. We've used that verse, by the way, down through the years for an evangelism verse and say, Jesus is knocking on your heart's door. We're twisting the text to say that. That's not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying, ladies and gentlemen of the church of the Laodiceans, I'm on the outside looking in. Open the door. Let me come in to your church. They have need of nothing, conceited and prideful. They're compromising, they're conceited, and they're also callous. Look at that 17th verse. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked? Look at that condemnation. Look at that critique of who they are and what they're doing. They were so compromising and conceited and so callous that the real condition of spirituality or the like thereof was not even recognized. He, Jesus said to them, and no, it's not. You don't even recognize. You don't see. You don't realize that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Let's look at those things piece by piece, if you will. First of all, he points out the real condition. They're pitiful. Thou art wretched. That word wretched means miserable, pitiful. All their wealth, all their positions, all their pride, and all that they had. Jesus said, you're wretched, you're pitiful, you're pitiful before the Lord. The question is, how does God see us today? How does he look at the church today? How is he looking at our lives individually today? He says, you're pitiful. Then he says, they're pathetic. And miserable, that word miserable means one that is the object of extreme pity or pathetic. The most pathetic person I believe today in the world is the one that feels that he has everything and doesn't need God. 
The most pathetic person is the one that has it all together. He has all of the credentials. He has all of the recognition, all of the uh, degrees, if you will. He has all of the position in society. And everything that the world has to offer, he has at his thumbs and at his finger t- uh, fingertips. But he does not know God. He is a pathetic person, miserable. Jesus says they're, they're, they're pitiful, they're pathetic, they're poor, and poor. It's the little word pinion. It means they're beggarly, destitute, bankrupt. And they are paupers, spiritually speaking. They have nothing, spiritually, Jesus says. Ponder for a moment the number of churches today that have wonderful facilities, a huge reputation, gigantic footprint in society, in the community they're in. Great band, orchestras, fantastic music, etc., etc. But when it comes to spirituality, Jesus Christ says you're pathetic, you're miserable, you're bankrupt, you have nothing, you do not have anything at all, you're poor, you're beggarly, you're a pauper, spiritually speaking. What's the church for? The church today has declined to nothing more than a religious service with rock and roll music for the most part. Religious service where you have entertainment, spiritual uh, or religious entertainment and not a relationship to Jesus Christ. Jesus says they're pitiful, they're pathetic, they're poor, and they are perceptionalist. He says in blind. He says you are spiritually blind. You don't even see where you are. You don't see that you're pitiful. You don't see that you're pathetic. You don't see that you're poor and bankrupt. They had the show and shine of the possessions, the prestige, but they were without any spiritual perception. They were just going through the motions, going through the religious motions. He says, you're powerless. They're powerless. Notice he says, and naked. Literally means nude, undressed, unclad, unprotected, unsafe, vulnerable. Spiritually speaking, he said, you are unclothed. Spiritually speaking, you are naked. You have nothing on. There's no spirituality whatsoever. There's no uh, relationship to Jesus Christ. Jesus says, just as the church, you're compromising, conceited, and callous. You don't see where you are. You don't really understand. You're pitiful. You're pathetic. You're perceptionless. You're poor. You're powerless. And you're spiritualist. Being lukewarm is dangerous. Very dangerous. I'd rather have you to be cold or hot than to be lukewarm. Jesus says, you're putrid as a result of it. And I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that identifies most of what is called Christianity today. I'll go to church on Sunday because it's a Sunday thing to do. I'll have a Bible on my coffee table when the pastor comes because it's the Christian thing to do. I will occasionally pray because Somebody one time said, that's what I need to do. I'll have the God talk on Sunday, but on Monday through Saturday, I'll live with the devil's crowd and walk with the world. That's what we're seeing in society today. And it's heartbreaking to realize that it's undermining and tearing down and destroying the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in our world and society. It's dangerous. Jesus says, I'd rather have you cold or hot but because you're lukewarm, you're putrid. The destination of the communication revealed, the description of the communicator recorded, the diagnosis of the church reviewed, but I want you to notice verse 18 through 22, the directive to the church registered. He gives a directive to the church. Notice the prescription. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me. Jesus says, rather than buying of the world, rather than being in the world, rather than receiving from the world, rather than embracing the world, I want you to buy from me. Jesus says, I've got the solution. I've got the cure. I've got the prescription. And that is me. Jesus Christ says, look at me. I'm the answer to where your needs are today. Notice, first of all, Jesus says, is the source of real riches, real riches. I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. Tried in the fire means to be refined. It means to be pure gold, unmixed gold, not fool's gold. By the way, I have an article, and this is, this is so telling. 
we could speak for the next hour and a half on this one point and this one verse. Jesus says, buy from me. I counsel thee, buy from me. Gold tried in fire. Jesus is the source of real riches. Fool's gold. Anybody ever heard of fool's gold? Back in the history, goes back a long way with this, back in the days of the gold mining, especially uh, out west, the gold mining that was taking place on the left coast and out west, uh, the gold miners would uh, many times uh, shortchange the buyer of the gold because they would have fool's gold. Fool's gold is, uh, fool's gold is pyrite. It's heavy, glistening, glittering, looks just like gold. Here's an article that says, Fool's gold is a common nickname for pyrite. Pyrite to receive the nickname because it's worth virtually nothing, but has an appearance that fools people into believing it's real gold. The nickname Fool's Gold has long been used by the gold buyers and prospectors who were amused by excited people who thought they had really found gold. These people did not know how to tell the difference between pyrite and gold. And their ignorance caused them to look foolish. That's exactly what was happening at Laodicea. They thought they had hit the gold mine. They thought they had the real thing. But Jesus says, I am the real gold. You are buying into fool's gold. You're buying into that which is false, that which is fake, that which is phony, that which is not real. Jesus said, buy from me gold. That is pure gold. Uh, we in American culture today, we bought into the fool's gold market as never before in the history of America. We bought into the fool's gold market. If it looks good and it glistens and he parts his hair right and he speaks right, if he can draw a crowd, then all of a sudden that's the real thing. I watched an old boy the other day on television. He was filling in. or He's from the same pulpit of Joel Osteen. Uh, last name is Gray, I believe it is, G-R-A-Y. And uh, he was preaching pure, unadulterated fool's gold. He wasn't preaching the real thing. He wasn't preaching about the real Jesus. And I thought about it then in retrospect in dealing with this text. He was speaking on the level that everybody wanted to hear. And that congregation, that uh, uh, stadium was filled with probably 35,000 people, just absolutely in an uh, awe-stricken state because he was feeding them fool's gold. And that's what was taking place in the church of the Laodiceans. They had bought into the glitz and the glitter of the world. They had embraced the world. They had riches untold. They did not have the riches of Jesus Christ in their lives and in the life of the church. They had bought into the fool's gold. Jesus says, I'm the real riches. I have the real uh, gold, tried, refined, unmixed. It's not fool's gold. Jesus offers us today the real wealth, the real riches, which is untold. Jesus is the best uh, uh, retirement plan that anybody could ever find on the face of the earth today. The whole song that says, I'd rather have Jesus than anything. I'd rather have Jesus than wealth untold. I'd rather have Jesus than uh, the world's uh, riches uh, that's offered today in every category. Uh, that old boy that was singing that song, by the way, I don't know if you know the story. It was just a little poem. And he sat down at the piano, and I believe the history will correct it. It was uh, stated it was probably a young teenager or a young man sat down at the piano, and he started putting, work, putting music to the poem, I'd rather have Jesus than wealth untold. I'd rather have Jesus than all that the world can afford. George Beverly Shea sang that song hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times during his lifetime. And may I remind us that ought to be the story of our lives. I'd rather have Jesus and wealth untold. The church of the Laodiceans did not understand that. Jesus says, I'm the source of real riches. Jesus says, I'm the source of royal raiment and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. He's already said, you're naked, you're unclothed spiritually. He says, I'm the robe of righteousness. I'm the only one that can robe you in the righteousness that the world cannot provide for you. Jesus had already told them, that they were poor and wretched and naked and spiritually unprotected and powerless. And now he says they need clothing. And the clothing that Jesus Christ offers is what I call royal raiment, spiritual garments, Jesus' righteousness and his righteousness alone. 
Jesus robes us in his royal robe of righteousness. Standing before the all-seeing eye of Jesus, he says, you're naked. You're naked. You need to be robed with me. You need me and not what the world has to offer. Jesus says, get dressed spiritually. Jesus says, put on the garments of my righteousness. The world offers only worldly rags, but I office royal riches for the one that will submit to me. Jesus is the source of real riches, royal raiment. Jesus is the right remedy. Notice he says, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Jesus has already said you're blind. And now he says you need spiritual vision. They had that medical center that produced the eye salve that was then exported around the then known world. Jesus reminds them that you need eye salve that you might see more clearly who I am and what I am doing and want to do for you. They had that medical center that produced that eye salve. But Jesus says you need spiritual vision. Jesus was saying you need more than what you see in the physical realm. You need spiritual vision. But notice in his pronouncement, his pronouncement, Jesus says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous. That's on fire. Be zealous. Be on fire. Not lukewarm. Be on fire. Therefore, and repent. He says, turn from the way you're going. Turn from your lukewarmness. Turn from your putrid position and repent. Turn to me is what Jesus Christ is pronouncing for them. Jesus says, I'm the one that chastens. I'm the one that rebukes. In fact, in Hebrews 12, 6 says, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. In Proverbs 3, 12. The word, the for whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. Jesus says here, be very careful. Be very careful. Repent. You notice the connectivity of the words. He says, for everyone that I love, I chasten. Therefore, repent. He's saying, unless there's repentance, I'm going to do the correction. Unless there's repentance, I'm going to do the chastening. Unless there's repentance, I'm coming after you. As uh, my boys would tell you, coming after you with the switch or the bell. And Jesus says, be very, very careful. Be warned. Be zealous. That word zealous means hot. Be on fire, not lukewarm. Be enthusiastic. Be boiling hot spiritually. And turn and repent from where you're going. And be zealous for me. I don't know of anything that can be said any more dogmatically than the need today for Christians in the church to be zealous for Jesus Christ. Christ and Christ alone is what we ought to seek to serve and not the world and the world's ways and the world's wishes and what the world wants for the church of Jesus Christ today. Not only do we see the prescription and the pronouncement, but I want you to notice in verse 20 through 22 as we close. I want you to notice the promise the promise. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus is outside of the church. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him, that is, fellowship with him, and he with me. I just made a little margin note how sad that this church, the church of the Laodiceans, the church identified in America today, the Laodicean church, we're in the Laodicean age. Jesus says, I'm outside the church. I'm outside the church. I'm knocking to get in. Will you, church, let me in? Will you, believer, will you, individual that claim to know me as Savior, will you open your heart and let me in? Jesus says, if you do, if you repent and open the door, this is what I want to do for you. This is the promise. Personal relationship. I will come in unto him and will fellowship with him and he with me. Jesus says, simply say yes to me. Say yes to me as Savior. Open the door. Let me into your heart. Let me into your life. Let me cause you to be zealous and enthusiastic and on fire for serving and celebrating the Lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. I want to have provide for you a personal relationship that you do not presently have. Not only he, he says in his promise of personal relationship, but positional relationship, 
To him that overcometh, that's the one that keeps on keeping on. That's the one that regardless of falling down, you get up. Regardless of the trials and the tribulation, you keep on serving Jesus. Regardless of the accusations, regardless of how, what the world might say about you individually as a church, you keep on serving, you keep on surrendering, you keep on sacrificing for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus says there to him that overcometh, the one that keeps on keeping on for Jesus, regardless of the trials and the tribulations, I will grant unto him to sit with me in my throne. Didn't say on my throne, in my throne. Shows the size, by the way. And you study the Revelation text in the fourth chapter and the fifth chapter, and you see for the child of God, the, after the rapture of the church, we'll be surrounding the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we'll be uh, singing praises, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb. We'll be casting our crowns and our rewards before his feet, singing worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb throughout all of eternity. May I remind us, the scripture says that we're heirs, joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, whatever he ha God has for Jesus, he has for us also. We'll rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ according to the scripture. In uh, Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10, the scripture says this, And hath made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth with him. And that's the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only do we have that personal relationship, that positional relationship, but we have that powerful relationship, the scripture says. Even as I also overcame, Jesus speaking, even as I, Jesus, also overcame and sat down with my Father in his throne. Jesus overcame sin, death, and the grave. He is victorious, and we have that powerful, victorious relationship with Jesus Christ when we say yes to him, when we open the door and allow him to come in to our churches, to our hearts, and our lives, and allow him to rule and to reign in our lives today. The prescription, the pronouncement, the promise, but in verse 22, closing, we see the plea. And he ends the letter to each of the seven churches with a similar plea. Jesus pleads with us to hear the Holy Spirit and to heed his voice. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. May we hear today with hearts to heed what the Lord Jesus Christ says to us. Here Jesus is pleading for us to hear the Holy Spirit's voice. Obey the voice of the Holy Spirit of God. Perhaps today you've come feeling that you've already arrived spiritually and you're just doing this out of rote responsibility. Then Jesus is saying, if you've got an ear to hear, hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. It's not a matter of education, academics, or earned credentials or degrees. It's not a matter of position or possession. It's not a matter of what we have and what the world thinks and what the world says. Jesus is saying, repent. Look to me, turn to me, allow me to clothe you with spirituality, allow me to uh, feed you and provide you with that which is real, allow me to provide the real goal and not the fool's goal, allow me to be on the throne in your heart and your life. The challenge is to repent. Change your heart, change your mind, change your direction. Do you realize that we, the number present today, we could turn this city right side up for Jesus Christ. We could see revival beginning in each of us individually if we would take seriously this word from Jesus Christ today. The awesome responsibility we have and the tremendous opportunity we have in a world that is dark and dying, blinded, we need to be salt and light, sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ while there's yet opportunity to do so. Would you stand please?